Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the year, two weeks into the year. And yeah, might as well start off with a big topic that's sure to get everyone. You didn't fit in with the show. Oh, yeah. Historia Canadiana. Welcome. If you click or on if you're on episode, Spotify, it's a cultural history of Canada. That's true. I shortened it. I shortened it because it would be easier to find. I noticed shortened that a lot of people... Wait, like, a cultural history of Canada is the shorter version? No, because it used to be Historia Canadiana, colon, a cultural history of Canada. Why did you shorten it to a cultural history of Canada? Why not just shorten it to Historia Canadiana? Because that's Spanish. And I'm like, we're, we're an English-speaking show, and I didn't ah, realize Historia that. Historia Canadiana! <laughs> right. But because when I started the show, I didn't speak well enough spanish to notice what i was doing <laughs> oh this whole time our canadian podcast has the name of a fucking telenovela yeah <laughs> the thing is you all know the worst part that's surprisingly on brand for us oh yeah i'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that it was a bad idea i just thought it would be better for branding if we didn't <laughs> God damn it. How, do you, how do you say hello in Spanish again? How do you say what? Span- hello. Oh, hola. Hola. Bienvenido a Historia Canadiana. Mi nombre es Patrick y uh, con mi es mi itinerario. Uh, ¿Cómo se dice? Uh, how do you say partner? I, love how... I think <laughs> this is a shit show. Mm-hmm. Off to a strong start on this new year. Donde esca, donde esta la biblioteca. Me llamo T Bone. La reina discoteca, discoteca, meneca, la biblioteca. Anyway, today. Sorry. So, before we get started into our topic, which you surely know what it's going to be if you clicked on the episode, uh, obviously, we'd like to thank our patrons uh, who help keep this show going. If you want to join our Hall of Patrons, you can do so for a dollar or three dollars a month and get some bonus episodes and early episodes and all of that fun stuff, or just do it for the fun of supporting us, which is cool too. We love support. Um, Hell yeah. I wish I got it from my parents, but you know, pipe dreams are fun. (laughs) Um, Okay. So Mac, today we have a big talk. What are we talking about today? Well, brother, friend, or as some might say, comrade. Says he as he looks into the camera. (laughs) Today we'll be talking about Canada's wonderful and beautiful history of the Red Scare, the Red Men, the Red Army, communism, baby. Hell yeah. Hammer and sickle. Instead of our regular... Um, theme song. I'm just going to have the theme song of the Soviet Union or of the former Yugoslavia. Oh, of course <laughs> just, you will. Just start off the episode with that. <laughs> God damn it. But some of our listeners might be thinking, why? Who gives a crap? No one, there, there are barely any communists left in Canada anymore. And that is technically true you can look at the voting numbers for the communist party of canada today and they get a, maybe a thousand across the entire country maybe a couple thousand i don't know not a lot um but the reason why we're doing this is that by the point that we are in the show right chronologically speaking the 1920s beginning of the 1930s ish the movement ish. was huge right the it's it's kind of difficult to understate just how big ideas surrounding marxism socialism communism a mix of all of these like basically radical ideas were back then right um and there's reasons for this we'll get into this but you know there's a reason why the communist party of canada and different workers parties emerged at this time and it's because these ideas really appeal to people um in powerful ways right uh, and also, it's just historically interesting to talk about because 
I don't know if you knew this, but the Communist Party of Canada is actually the second oldest party in Canadian history, right? Mm. <laughs> or at least longest running, like nonstop. Yeah, yeah. Well, because um, the in Canada, the fed we had the federals, and then there was it took a while for there to be other parties, didn't it? So we had the um, we had the Liberal Party, right? Yeah. That's that's the longest running party in Canada, nonstop. Uh, it's right. been there since the beginning. Yeah. But from the beginning, we also had the conservatives, but technically they're not the second run longest running because they yeah. stopped existing after a while and then came back under new management, right? So you had John A. McDonald's liberal conservatives, and then it, tr it transformed into what it became in the 80s. Mm -hmm. That crashed and burned. And then it became post-2003 what it is now, right? Mm -hmm. And it went through shifts and reconglomerations. Um, that's what it was right so that we technically had yes yeah yeah and then all of our prime ministers have either been conservatives or liberals yes there's never been anything else right mm -hmm. on a provincial level that's different premiers have been quite varied but on a federal level it's okay. only been one of the two yeah conservative yeah. and then there's progressive conservative and then it went back to regular conservative technically what's his name um borden was union for a bit yeah he was unionist but that was just fake conservative that was conservative under a different name. fake news it's <laughs> totally total fake it's no no founding in reality it's fake news it's all lies yep yep but so th i think that's just historically interesting to know and as valid a reason as any to talk about this idea and party is because despite it being tr despite the powers that be trying to make it illegal since its foundation, the party has like kept going for over a hundred years. And that's mm -hmm. an achievement in and of itself. Right? Uh, say what you will about the ideas associated with the party. It's I think still an interesting fact about it and worthy of mention. Mm -hmm. But before we get into that for, uh, for Elise, right. Is the segment of our show. Yeah. For Elise <laughs> is the line we use when talking about my mother. <laughs> and that's Matt. because this is especially pertinent i'm gonna hijack this for a second this is especially no, go pertinent ahead please because my mother does i'm gonna put her on blast for a second and put her in the spotlight she likes to send long messages to us well no she sends long messages to me privately and then i say mother we're gonna have we have to separate business from family right now so you're gonna have to send like reviews and complaints to historic nadiana so that way we can like give a proper response from both of us and so we can both talk about it which and, is fine uh, by the way i really yeah. appreciate that i just oh, want to no, cut we in. love I reviews really like i love criticism yeah. you know what i've grown up with criticism my whole life it's fine and again this is criticism from my mother this is nothing new <laughs> so this is really why but um we especially get some when it comes to topics of capitalism versus socialism sure uh, sure yeah, those are big topics for her. Um, the monarchy, the role of the monarchy in Canada was a big one. And so <laughs> we're, this is us basically, because we always make the joke, right? Like, oh, we're communists. Ha, 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 ha. When, I don't know, like, if you really ask us to identify ourselves politically, Patrick would be an anarchist at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd be some, like, vanilla bitch liberal, you know? So... Well if you really want to put a name on it, I generally associate with the left, broadly speaking, but I do find yeah. it very difficult. And we can talk about this further if you want. I do find it difficult to associate with a specific current of thought, just because it depends on what issue we're talking about. Yeah, right? that's just it. Yeah. You see, if you really want to put a label on it, you can say like left anti-capitalism. That's fine. I don't care. Um, yeah, I'm probably but it really more varies. left. I'm I'd... I, if I took a test, I'd probably come out center left, but closer to like left yeah. left than the center. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, where I usually, and we can talk about this um, as we do our little like communism one hundred and one course, like crash mm. course. <laughs> but like, I'll be John Green. I... You'll be Hank Green. This is crash course. <laughs> so communism. But where I usually like come up against it is the Revolutionary Act. Like theoretically, I get why marxists advocate for that right and we can talk mm -hmm. about that again later that's usually where i 
know my own limitations of actually being able to perform that revolutionary act, I feel like that's not something I would be capable or willing to do, mm -hmm. right? And that's where, for example, there's other differences, but that's just an easy example that I can give of why I don't necessarily fully associate with that particular strain of thought, right? right? I don't know if that makes sense. Right. No, no, it does. I get it. Yeah. And it's okay. what we're like, we're not one to one. We're not even, I'd say, experts in. I have an interest in it, but yeah. it's not, I'm not an expert yet. Like, none of us are any kind of master of this. Mm -hmm. So I think, like, we're going to give, like, our understanding. We're going to give, like, the textbook definition of communism along with and how it came about. Or in Canada. Yeah, it took prior lease in Canada. How it sort of evolved and changed. What makes it like? There's a lot, you know, in the way political combat goes this days. Political discourse. People have almost started really to equate socialism with communism. Which is yeah, not the same. Even at no. the time, even when it was first started, like the the, the OGs did not consider it the same thing. <laughs> no, and that's still true to this day. So mm -hmm. I think like we're gonna have to dispel some of the myths of communism and what what it actually kind of means but i'm with you like the whole like revolutionary act of it and again politics is just so convoluted folks we're going to take this one step at a time yeah i don't know what we'll have time to talk about or not i have a bunch of notes that i prepared but we'll we'll see how this conversation goes and oh, where don't it worry takes I'll, us. I'll make sure to limit you if we reach a certain point yeah no that's fair like yeah. i'll give you like <laughs> I'll, I'll treat it like it's like almost like a high school debate and i'll be like okay one hour warning, yeah. you guys. One hour. Okay. So getting into the crash course part of it, there's like three elements of the theory, Marxist theory, that I've kind of parsed out. There's obviously hundreds of years of this theory that have been uh, analyzed and talked about and debated through sociology, political science, literature. There's a huge strain for people who are interested in the cultural aspect of it, of like Marxist literary criticism, right? The, all of that can be taken into account. We're, we can't talk about it all. That's its own podcast, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I kind of brought it down into three concepts, which is to say historical materialism, the dictatorship of the proletariat, and class struggle, right? Um, I feel like that those three concepts can very much be associated with one another and condense some of the main ideas associated with Marxism. Um, do you agree so far? Oh, yeah. 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 Cool. So Matt, for Elise, what, what, which one would you start off with? I guess we could start off with uh, historical materialism. In this case, we'll go in order here. So, What's your understanding? Because I know you've taught it or you've used it in school before. Right. And you've at least yeah. engaged with these ideas before. So what's your understanding of well, so this idea? that's that's the more Marxist view of history, isn't it? Or yeah. like what we mm -hmm. almost call Marxism. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's how we understanding like a lot of the the history of human society, and human civilization as conflict and struggles between those in power and those without power, the powerful but we get the powerless. Absolutely. So for his time, Marx threw around the word bourgeoisie a lot, and that's sort of become, but it's like any, if you take a long look at history, there's always been a struggle, though those who have, those who have not, have always been, whether that be monarchs and the peasants, and the citizens, the leaders, the rulers, that's always, like, that's how we sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a lens to view the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And we we should make this clear. Like, it's, yes, this is historical theory, but even Marx himself from the get go was not saying that this is a strict view or way to look at the world. There are different ways to view class and different interpretations of class. For example, right? Most like, of what this yeah this lens is going to cross over with other ones a whole whole yeah. lot. Yeah. The, the the lens of Marxism overlaps with feminism in a way. The struggle a lot of between those who like have a... and those have not. That's feminism too. It's just that we put a much stronger label of women who have no power struggling against patriarchy with all the power. Like that's the sort of idea. It's not like, oh, this is the only correct way to look at the world. It's just, oh, this is a way that we can study the world. You know, exactly. so it's and 
and that's the part that I, that I think is the really tricky part people have with these terms like communism and feminism and that they because they they don't see the shades about like yeah. oh this is just a way to view things they only see it as like they are the, they've been told no they're trying to enforce their viewpoint upon you exactly um and to add on to what you were just saying so you were talking about the class element of uh this particular uh thought but historical materialism goes even deeper to that is that one of the ways to understand class and the way that society is structured is through material production right the actual concrete uh economic social and material structures that legislate and you know dictate how people live their lives right mm -hmm. um to put it in a really concise way marx has a famous quote that says men make their own history but they do not make it alone right historical materialism kind of is that where it's to say yeah. that individual human beings he was using men here as all human beings because that was the 19th century but individual human beings can make choices free will is a thing mm -hmm. but they never make these choices in a vacuum right um they make them because of economic constraints they make them because they're a peasant who needs to who can only grow carrots for example on their mm -hmm. plot of land that right that has an impact on the way that a society is run right whether you mm -hmm. see it in the particular moment or not and you know people listening to this today might say well yeah duh of course people don't make their history alone right society is interconnected and it's important to put this into context right when marx was writing he was very much writing in a time when this was not taken for granted yeah. right um the dominant view of history is still very much you still see it sometimes because it's the Victorian history type of way of seeing it where great men make history or ideas make history, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than a interesting mix and match of people, thoughts, materiality, all of that uh, put together, right? In this great soup that we call history. It's not a force. Right. History is people. Right? History is legends. Um, right. right. So... And and basically to add on to this is that, you know, yes, you know, there's the famous Marx quote that starts off the communist manifesto, right? The history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. That's kind of what you were referring to. And each of these new stages of class struggle bring about new modes of production, right? Um, there were classes, or at least he saw this kind of amorphous uh, lack of class in what he called primitive societies, right? Yep. Hunter gatherers, right? But there was still a mode of production there and that legislated how society was operated. And then for example, you have feudal class relations, but that yeah. also legislated how proper uh, production was legislated. And this changed across the world, of course. And now today, according to Marx and but just facts, we live under capitalism, <laughs> right? which is where in Marx's words, the bourgeoisie, the property owners, right? The people who own the factories in Marx's time or who today own Amazon, for example, right? Uh, they're the ones who control the means of production, right? And the people who work under them, the proletariat in Marx's words, so factory workers in his time and Amazon truck drivers today, um, would be the people whose labor is taken from them, right? From whom the uh, bourgeoisie make a profit, right? Again, that's how capitalism is viewed. This is very much a shortened version of this. Oh, there are right? so many waves and shades and like first wave, sec like there's so much shit we're not getting into. This is the absolute basic understanding of communism. And like, I do highly encourage people, at least read the manifesto if you're interested. It's literally meant to introduce people to that. It yeah. was meant, like, there is no way you cannot not understand it because it was meant to be understood by factory workers in the 19th century. If they can understand it, so can you. And this is <laughs> mostly us, like, really, we're just trying to be like, oh, this is a viewpoint. This is how we're trying to explain things right now. Neither of us are anyway saying like this is correct or the right way. Well, we're, we we're can being... actually get into that. Yeah. 
I think he's right. Like having read Capital Volume One, the one that was the only one that was published in the in his lifetime, mm-hmm. right? I think his view of how capitalism functions and the mechanisms through which it reproduces itself as a system of society is accurate. I, again, don't necessarily fully agree with his solution towards it and what the next step is, but his analysis and pathology of what capitalism is as a system, I think has never been parallel. I think it is a work of So capitalism as like a system of abuse and struggle or both insofar as like it it is an economic system that you know powers itself on the fact that some very few people own the means of production right that is all they do i don't don't think anybody is going to argue with that like if we call capitalism a race that means that somebody has to lose exactly Right? Like and the mechanisms through which he analyzed this again, I think have been unparalleled. There's a reason why oh, people sure. understand it the way that they do today is mostly because he was able to do all of this footwork that prior to then was not done. Right. And again, you can disagree with his diagnosis of what to do with that. But I think the way that he actually was able to bring forth the subtleties and intricacies of how capitalism worked in 18 in the 1800s and still very much to this day, even though most of us don't work in factories, I think is still still holds true today in many ways. And that there's a reason why the book is continuously reprinted, right? Even though the it's you know, there is no communist country. Right? Yeah, no, we right. but like there's no real communist country. There's some that claim no. to be. No, but it's a good analysis of what the world we live in looks like. Well, now, just like to make I... it... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just I, I latch on and jump on top of what you're saying for springboard off your idea, mm-hmm. comrade. Our idea, really. I do. I actually don't. I actually, like, if you like, if you sold me to look at things, like, I'd be like, yeah, no, like, Marx is right. Like, there is con, even with the best boss or the best, like, the best boss and best worker relationship, there's still a dynamic and difference in power. And that is inherent to what it is like. There, mm-hmm. it's it, it's just that it's more like a friendly rivalry between sports teams instead of a full on class war at that point. Yeah, you know, it still all needs to be overthrown. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yo, but, get the re- don't get the revolution going. I'm I'm part of the means of production. That didn't... <laughs> That's what's interesting. And so, when you were saying like our ideas, I know that you were making a joke out of it in this case. But that's like one of those common misconceptions that you were talking about mm. of communism is that there's no such thing as personal or individual ideas under communism, yeah. right? Which is which to Marx was like the next step forward after capitalism, right? For Marx, capitalism had its advantages, which is to say it allowed for the mass production and efficiency that would allow us to propel ourselves into the next stage of humanity, which to him was like no longer needing to toil away for basic necessities, right? Mm -hmm. And that workers who are now constrained to factories would be able to do what they wanted and still live comfortably. Um, Now, a lot of people interpret Marx's idea of like, well, we have to abolish private property as the same thing as saying, well, I have to share my toothbrush with my neighbor now. And it's like, no, right? And this is like a difference in language that needs to be addressed is that private property for Marx is not the same thing as personal property, Yeah. right? Um, Private property for Marx is literally just like the factory that's owned by a single individual, right? Or again, to put it in contemporary terms, um, for example, it would be Tesla, wherein Elon Musk makes the decisions um, based solely on what makes a profit and not based on what the workers are able to produce and what they want to produce, right? Or what they think is useful for society to produce, right? That's the difference. Personal property is something else. Nobody ever said that you can't have your own toothbrush. (laughs) That's, That's not a thing. Yeah, nobody said you had to give up all your stuff to like your hippie down the street or whatever. That's not what it... Exactly. 
Now, there are some things that should that, according to Marx, would be put into common, which is to say the decisions related to work, right? Yeah. What we do, how we do it, why we do it, things that, you know, the person who actually produces or the people who actually well, produces the stuff should take together, right? Yeah. Those are the things that are put into common. God, I can't um, wait for the messages we're going to get my mother. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait. He's going to message but for me many, first. Well, look, like, again, please. I'm, I you know, please disagree with the censure critiques. If you're Mr. Peanut Monopoly Man pro capitalism, go ahead, tell us. Like, I don't give a shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't like, care if people and, have dissenting opinions against me. That's part of the, this like, is, that's think, how we get to the solution. This is, I think, one of the biggest difficulties of talking about this in the 21st century is that we live in a post Soviet world for a good or bad. Yeah. Right. What that means is that what we now have to contend with is the fact that all we have really as an example of what communism tried to do was the Soviet Union. Some of those things were good. Some of the things went very bad, right? But that's the images that people have. Like whenever someone says like, oh, I'm a Marxist, immediately in North America, at least people are automatically going to think oh, so you like Stalin, right? They're going to think like Stalinist or something like that, which is yeah. not the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, and there are reasons why those things happened historically. If we take a historically materialist view of things, there are reasons. And right, um, there's a logic to why historically things played out like they did in the Soviet Union. But it's not fair to say that just because it happened there that way. And I do genuinely think, by the way, that they were trying to bring in communism there. Um, I do think there was a genuine attempt. But... It's not fair to say that every opportunity has to end up that way, because that's a misunderstanding of history um, and how societies operate. That's my two cents on it. Yeah. But I don't know if you have anything to add on that. <laughs> uh, no, I no, I'm getting you. I'm following you. I'm picking up what you're putting down. And it, it is like we're dealing with such loaded words that have come with such long histories behind them like it's so hard to then dissect and distance them from where they're coming from yeah exactly yeah. damn it stalin you ruined the revolution i mean kind of <laughs> <laughs> look i'll say this there's an interesting philosopher from slovenia called slavoj zizek mm -hmm. and this kind of fits in with my example of why history plays out in the way it does i want to make this very clear I do not agree. I am not a fan of Stalin. I want to make that like extremely clear, <laughs> right? But the at the so at the time, for example, in the Soviet Union, the only viable alternative, or at least major alternative, to Stalin was Leon Trotsky, right? Who advocated for a continued revolution, like that the revolution continue and its struggle continue. But in the context of the Soviet history at the time, what that would have meant is continue what at that point was a civil war that had already killed millions. And they had just gone out of World War I, and they were heading into civil war, famine, and so on. You know, historically, what, you, what a society wants at those moments is stability and not continued revolution, right? And that's what Stalin offered, warts and all, right? Um, and so that's, for example... An, a, an example of how a Marxist would view history saying, yeah, it sucks, but the material conditions of the time asked or demanded that someone like Stalin, if not Stalin himself, would have arisen out of these ashes to offer that stability and strength of character to at least stabilize the country, right? Again, not a fan of what he did at all, but that would perhaps be a historical understanding of why that particular situation emerged. You're laughing as if I'm like digging a hole for myself, but does that no, make sense? Fine. Yeah, no, it is. It, 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 again, it's just, it's so, it's going to be such a funny episode to try and listen back to because it's good for us like doubling back on our words constantly. Like, we're not saying this, but we're kind of saying this, you know? That's what's frustrating. I find it so frustrating to live in that world, right? Where we are living with decades of very fixed ideas about what these ideas are rather than allowing them to breathe and exist on their own mm -hmm. right in part in part because of like cold war shenanigans and in part because of the fact that we no longer have societies like this to stand on their own yeah. right and say otherwise right? 
no, and it's it's I don't know. There's there's levels to communism, you guys. It isn't just like oh, the government owns everything. No, although the same a bit way more there's levels to capitalism. Exactly, although I, a little I'm bit Subway. more nationalizing would be fun. <laughs> yeah, a little bit more like us taking care of each other would be nice, you guys. Just you know. Bit, or maybe let's at least decency. let's at least keep what we have. Let's not, you know, privatize uh, Hydro Quebec. You know, <laughs> fucking hell, like, the one nationalizing thing that works properly. <laughs> uh, anyway, all I'm saying is I have guillotine dreams that pop up every once in a while, and uh, listen, yep. haven't we all dreamed of off Elon Musk's head? <laughs> Just a little bit. Just. Just a Jeff smidge. Jeff Bezos, other CEOs, the Monopoly man. Jeff Bezos. You know what really turned me against him? What? He laughs like an evil genius. Like, have you ever seen that clip of him where he just straight up looks like Lex Luthor? You know what really makes me afraid of him? He's actually competent at what he does. I Musk know. Musk is just a clown. He's a drug-addicted clown. And he owns so much. Ah. Anyway. Do you have anything else that you want to add on the Communism 101 section, or shall we move on to how it permeated in Canada? Do it. How did it permeate in Canada? How did we get the Reds the red scared? Well, it all started because people were fed up with being exploited. <laughs> Jesus. Almost like that happens everywhere around the world. And that there's a reason why in the most exploited countries of the world, India, Latin America, and Africa, you still see major left-wing movements that purport to be communist. Because it's bullshit that they're exploited that way. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> like people shouldn't be treated like they're cattle. What a, I don't understand what you're saying. We what? need to take care of our workers. What? They're and there to make me money. Well, that again, like, and then you, you're going to say this and then you're going to have a bunch of people on there. So I'd be like, oh, but there's good businesses. And it's like, that's great. We don't care. Yeah. Well, it's also, it doesn't <laughs> matter if there's good businesses. No. There's a bunch of shit ones too, you guys. There's still work that needs to be done. If you buy local, it's not as hard capitalism. <laughs> but buy local. <laughs> so do I. But there's this image sometimes, of, I, I get this sense a lot from people, it's like, well, I'm buying local, so it's better. Technically, maybe. Like, you're not exploiting a Guatemalan, you're exploiting a Montrealer, I guess. Yeah. Well, in that, it's, it's just one, again, like, so many labels. I was about to get into a big vegan rant, but we're not going to go there right now. Oh, sure, go ahead, fuck it. Well, it's like, you know, it's... Oh, shit, sure. we're not exploiting the animals right now, but we're exploiting all the fucking South American workers that work on these plantations to death. Bingo. There for you fucking go. fucking almond milk. For fucking almond milk, which, by the way, is, like, environmentally worse than regular fucking milk at this point with how much fucking water it takes and how many trees we have to cut down to grow the goddamn almonds. Drink go oat off, milk, King. bitches. Oat milk. Make your own oat milk. Or just don't drink milk. We're not supposed not to it. drink milk after a certain <laughs> age. Most humans lose the part of them that drinks goddamn milk. It's like but then, how am I gonna get my my latte in the morning? Be a real man. Stop drinking you with milk, or be like grow up, you fucking millennial kid. <laughs> Take your coffee like you like it, black. Yeah. But that, but that's. That's how I that that's a really good example though, right? Because the idea is not to abolish the fact that people have these things, mm. right? It's to say, no, you should just actually properly pay and compensate the people who do produce these things for you, right? Acknowledge that the coffee that you drink in the morning, you know, you pay 15 bucks for a bag of coffee or whatever, or 20 bucks, but the person who actually picked the coffee for you roasted the coffee for you and packaged it for you gets paid 15 dollars in their entire year maybe yeah right and that's bullshit someone's not getting paid there right um, and again it's also just the question do these billionaires really need billions of dollars yes because they need to buy another plane i think me and patrick have like we've discussed i 
I'm just going to throw out my own. Like, I'm literally just going to put my ideas out there, roast me for them, whatever, and then we can keep going with no, the history it. of communism in Canada. Because me Go and Patrick off, have talked about this. But, like, and I think we're both in agreement at this. At the very least, no single person needs to have more than a billion dollars. No. No single person needs to have a more than a maybe a million. I would no, say like, that's the biggest cap. Like, a, I, no, I don't know. I don't no, know. Like the, the million that's, thing. That's like, like, like listen, money. listen, listen. We got to meet each other halfway in all this, you know? You say this because I've never reached that amount of money. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also like, so we have to reach out with compromise. So I think a billion is a good place to start. And sure. I, I really honestly believe like, individual like not businesses businesses i understand for the growth of the market and economics or whatever those need to continue to grow in their caps and blah 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 but like a single person should not be a company and in that same vein a single person should not be worth a single person should not have a gdp greater than a g8 country and that's kind of what's interesting as well like this is something that marx brings up and is the idea that like capitalists, like the bourgeoisie that he calls, are also very much slaves in their own way. They're slaves to the market, right? The so-called free market where they need to constantly expand and do this thing to the detriment of the environment, of the other workers, of the political system, right? Because otherwise, someone else is just going to take the take that spot, right? So either they do it or someone else does and that's kind of what's interesting about his analysis as well, by the way, is that he explains it in a way that it's like a system that exists with or without that particular person, right? Which fits in with the wider historical materialist concept, right? You can either play the game or you fail, right? Or you just die. And that's kind of what's interesting about considering that particular form of history, right? Is that it fits in exactly with what you're saying. It's like, nobody needs that much money. But we live in a world where if someone decides not to do it, someone else is going to do it. So stupid. Right? right? Like, I can mean, you imagine? Well, it's like, also like, you think... people also don't understand just how new the whole idea that we're working with with capitalism is. Like, if you go speaking, back, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go back a couple hundred years, people did not have the insane work days that they do now. Uh, yeah, no, it's no. true. No, it's true. No, Historians it's true. have taken this yeah. into effect. Like yeah, they've literally true. studied the work days of like they take the lowest common classes across history, and only it's only happened in the last 150, 175 years of the Industrial Revolution that people have been working themselves to death lately. Yeah, Even like yeah. actual farmer peasants mm -hmm. in France at the time of the French Revolution were working less hours than a factory worker. Yeah. okay it's, yeah with like more holidays more religious holidays whatever like it's fucking mental also yeah, that we, we need to produce scrape more. out all that we can scrape out five bucks at the end of the day and those people can take their five bucks and for all it's worth shoved up their ass at that point because at some point there's a cap to what you can buy yeah <laughs> right? and this is like this is a hundred percent a self-imposed human thing other animals don't mm -hmm. do this folks that's the thing it's like it's interesting when you say like there should be a cap. You're still assuming that we live in the particular system that we're living in. The communists that we're talking about today would say something akin to in a communist world, there wouldn't be a need to accumulate that particular way, right? Yeah. Because technically you would have everything that would be basic necessity provided for you either by industrialization Mm -hmm. Or the fact that it's a well-oiled machine, right? And that everything else afterwards is slight extra that you're producing on your own, mm -hmm. right? Um, or with your collective, right? Mm -hmm. Of other workers who do similar things. I don't know, right? Um, so it's interesting, right? To to consider even changing the mentality of like the idea of accumulating a certain amount of money only makes sense in this particular world, right? Because in any other context, it's insane. Right? It doesn't make sense. It's nonsense. <laughs> that just doesn't make sense, folks. No, but right. But again, that's in the particular world that we're living in, which you know, there are there some are. advantages. Right. <laughs> um so origins of the party. Yeah. So remember how we talked about the Winnipeg strike last episode? Yeah, baby. Right. The Winnipeg strike that didn't do anything, baby. 
there you go. Well, some people decided to do something about it, right? Because they saw that people were unhappy and that there was unrest among the working class, right, uh, of Canada, right, and the world in general at this point, which is industrializing across the world in the early 20th century. And there had been attempts at making workers parties um, or socialist parties before in Canada in the early 20th century, in like 1904 or 1903, I think there was a socialist party, mm -hmm. but they never lasted particularly long, right? They were usually very ephemeral. Um, either they were tracked down upon by police officers in the state or they just the didn't garner enough people on a federal scale to go anywhere, right? right? But again, and this kind of fits in with the historical materialist view, right? By the 1920s, enough people had become aware right, that, hey, there is an issue with the world that we're living in. Things um, are kind of a little bit fucked up. I'm sorry. Things that are kind of a little bit fucked up. <laughs> just a little bit. Right. Just, just, like just why smidge. is Timmy working? Why is little Timmy, who's five years old, working in a factory, right? And getting his arm ripped off and no one cares, right? But hey, someone's you know, that's such a fucked up like that actually happens. We're not even joking with that part. That was just straight I know. up a real thing. No, that's that's absolutely a thing. And I'm making a kind of a facetious way, I'm putting it in a kind of jokey way. But there's a really great um, historian called Ian McKay, who works out of Carleton, I think, um, who's been doing this like overarching project of the Canadian left. Mm -hmm. And he actually pinpoints this very fact as something that radicalized a lot of people is industrial accident, right? Because it's something tangible that people could witness with their own eyes and say, hey, I shouldn't be putting my life on the line for this so that this guy can eat another pheasant at Christmas. Right. <laughs> like that doesn't that doesn't make sense because it's all well and fine to tell someone that someone is making profit off of your back. But that's something that's a little bit intangible for a lot of people and abstract, too abstract for some people to understand. Right. How do you visualize pulling profit out of someone? Right. But a, an actual workplace injury or poverty right, in a material sense, is something that can be visualized and experienced. And that's something that McKay points to as like very much a radicalizing factor for a lot of people in North America, saying like, okay, I don't want to eat dirt for the rest of my life. I want to be right. able to actually live, not survive. I want to be able to, you know, like do things and not just like work, like literally just be a robot. Yeah. There's a Which, reason that this this time period also becomes incredibly concerned with science fiction writing. You know, bring back that class. <laughs> Do you remember that course that we took together? The machine together? stops. The machine. Uh, no, uh, wasn't it um, the Carl Chapek? Um, um, but like all this uh, to say, like there's yeah. these things have historical precedence. Like these things didn't like. Yeah come out of nowhere we've been discussing these things that's why whenever you say that you hate it now that your sci-fi show your movie or whatever has gone political i'm sorry to break it to you honey it's been political the whole time never wasn't yeah i'm sorry right just the fact of producing a show in that particular way is a political yeah statement there is right? no perfectly like totally what is it objective way of looking at the world that's in some enlightenment bullshit you know exactly um and it, we all know fuck the enlightenment we're anti-enlightenment on this show in this house we're <laughs> anti-enlightenment <laughs> voltaire fuck eat God. your goddamn heart out so basically we live the... like diet jenny's in this goddamn household hell yeah with nothing I live in a and barrel. in a bell a barrel <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i like being called a dog by my boss okay it this makes me feel nothing happy. more than a bunch of plucked chickens. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm I'm losing the thread on this because it was <laughs> stolen by from me by the bourgeoisie. So, the history of the party: May 1921, in a barn just outside Guelph, Ontario, 22 men and women, including an undercover police agent, met to create the Communist Party of Canada. Hell yeah! So, I love that fact. Already from the outset, there was government 
like infiltration into this. They were not they were not going to let this happen, right? And this kind of demonstrates a kind of overarching or underlying current, I should say, of the Communist Party of Canada is that it would come up against the RCMP and the state so often, right? Um, they were hounded. There were explicit laws put into place um, that would make it so that communists were not allowed to operate, right? When we say Red Scare, a lot of people like associate it with the McCarthy era. In 1937, under Mackenzie King, we had what was called the padlock law, which literally barred the homes of anyone who was a suspected communist, right? Like, this is what we're dealing with. And this is in Canada. This is not in the U.S. This is in a supposedly social democratic state, right? Like, fuck you, right? And this is like a blatant abuse of civil rights, right? Over someone's opinion on how society yeah, should be run. The Reds will come and they'll ruin everything if we don't stop them. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna make me share my toothbrush. <laughs> Why do you keep coming back to the toothbrush? It's an example that I've heard way too often and it haunts me. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've heard it way too often. And I my mom has given me that example. I'm like, no, that's I'm sorry. But um, anyway, um, what kind of distinguished the Communist Party, of course, is not just the fact that it hit there's kind of a right place, right time type of thing where enough people joined the party that it was able to um, uh, to to very much set itself up um, and concretize itself but also just wider international affairs, right? Uh, not four years ago, there was the Russian Revolution, right? Which galvanized a socialist state for the first time in history, right? Into something that at this point in time was going through a civil war, but still was something technically in place, right? Um, and this would very much inspire the men and women who formed the Communist Party of Canada, right? Um both inspire and also dog the communist party because one of the disadvantages that a lot of this uh, that this party had was that it almost didn't want to criticize the soviet union right a, a big founding aspect of this particular party was that they were imagining international socialism right socialism across the world um, no countries left behind, but that the Soviet Union would lead because it was the first, right? And at this point, or at least in the early days of the Communist Party of Canada, there wasn't anything that said that things had gone that wrong in Russia or in the Soviet Union, right? Um, Stalin hadn't come to power yet. You could still pass off a lot of things on natural disasters that led to famine or civil war, right? Um but, you know, after the Second World War, um, a lot of people would start to see through what the Soviet Union had become under Stalin, for example, which is to say an authoritarian state, right? Um, and a lot of people became disillusioned with what that meant. And so, again, you can kind of make the argument that just because it happened like that in the Soviet Union doesn't mean it has to happen like that elsewhere. But a lot of people still felt disillusioned that this so-called you know, great state of the Soviet Union would fall to such depths. Um, you're muted, by the way. Ah, great state. That's it? <laughs> That's it. Like, yeah. I will clown as much as I, I want the Soviet Union as I will the capitalism in Canada and all that. Like, I'll clown on both of them. Oh, yeah. And that's what's kind of interesting. We didn't really talk about it, but like a major founding part of Marxist theory is what's called the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? Which is to say that the proletariat takes power, right, over the bourgeoisie, mm. right, in a class struggle and imposes its will as the majority, right, the true majority in this class based view of history um, onto the minority of the bourgeoisie, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some people, at least at first, argued that that's kind of what was happening in the Soviet Union, right? Uh, that it was basically just the dictatorship of the proletariat, and that eventually this would wither away into something else. Mm -hmm. um, 
And one of the major issues that the Soviet Union faced and that eventually a lot of the people in the Communist Party of Canada would would see is that one of the major issues of that the Soviet Union was facing is that you were increasingly dealing with a stultifying bureaucracy and a new elite, right? It wasn't actually bourgeois people. Uh, it wasn't actually proletarians necessarily that were in power, although some were, but just kind of a new elite that was forming and reproducing some of the elements that nominally they were trying to get rid of. Um, again, there's various ways that you can discount this and look at it another way, but that's at least the perception that the Communist Party of Canada members faced after the Second World War, right? Um, okay. Funny enough, like, do you know of any of the successes that the Communist Party actually faced in Canada? Or was it just like failures on failures in your mind? Uh, no, I can't think of too much. Of like, like, I don't even know if too much of success or failure. Like, it's just so little talked about. And again, people have yeah. conglomerated the idea of socialism, NDP with communism in their heads. Yeah. I mean, that's... It's for a de that's definitely a discussion for another time. The NDP started off as an explicitly socialist part, right? And it was kind of warped into just liberal lights into what it is now, right? Oh, over time. But it was explicitly like a, a socialist party um, yeah. when it was first started. Absolutely. I mean, so there's a grain of truth. has morphed over time into basically just um, conservatism light anyway. Yeah, exactly. Diet yeah. conservatism. Yeah. We hide the racism better. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would get on board with that. <laughs> um, but there were actually like some uh, advantages, right? The Communist Party was very much at the forefront of major um, workers' rights in Canada, right? Helping push, um, you know, immigrant uh, communities who were getting screwed over or workers who were getting screwed over, often the two were the same, right? Um, in order to get better uh, advantages within their communities or within their workplaces, right? L helping to form unions or get better, mm -hmm. uh, get better trade deals, all that jazz. Um, but they were also major elements in feminist movements, right? Again, talking to your point that you were bringing up earlier of the overlap between race, class, gender, right? All of this doesn't operate independently from each other, right? A lot of feminists yeah. were very much within left-wing movements. Um, a lot of immigrants as well, right? Ukrainians, Finns, Jews, all kinds of Eastern European immigrants brought with them radical ideas, right? Because they wanted, um, you know, a better life in Canada. Um, Probably one of the most famous people associated with the Communist Party was its eventual leader, uh, Tim Buck. Um, Tuck, uh, Tim Buck kind of became uh, one of the only people who actually was elected to the House of Commons, right, under the uh, CPC. And, you know, that's kind of one of the major victories that you can claim for the party, at least, is that it actually made it into the House of Commons a few times. Obviously, that's a pipe dream nowadays in a post-Cold War uh, world, right, where the party gets like a couple hundred votes. Um, but at the time, right, it does go to show just how strong or how numerous it was, um, you know, at its height in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and part of that helps in that... Um, Buck and others were particularly concentrated in highly industrial areas, right? Like Guelph, um, yeah. which is where a major part of their base was. Um, and a disadvantage is that a lot of their um, a lot of their voters were spread out across Canada, which, in the way that our electoral system works, does not get you elected, right? Um, because we don't have proportional representation here, right? We go by ridings, uh, which is of course, not at all the same and very much advantages mm -hmm. the um, continued voting of liberals and conservatives, liberals and conservatives everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah, the NDP had one good showing a couple elections ago, and that's about it. Yeah, it's about as far as they're going to go. 
<laughs> because the block still exists too. Yeah. Like, and that, that's, that's kind of what's interesting is that what I feel is kind of um, interesting about the Communist Party of Canada is that on paper, it did advocate for revolutionary action, but it still played the game of being an official party, right? You could still vote for them. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, right? Like, the because technically, a lot of communists are against voting in, like, the current liberal state, right? Um, because it does not represent it. It's like almost a foolhardy, um, uh, it's almost a foolhardy situation, right? That no, but just sounds uh, like I, an excuse not to vote. That's the thing. It's kind of interesting. Like, I get technically what the point is of saying like well you're never gonna change the system by voting in a system that's rigged against you right from the start and you can see many i just like i know there's a lot of people that are going to disagree this is might be an actual hot take for me this time i just i can't get my mind around the people who just give up like, That's oh, the, the system's thing. broken, therefore I'm not going to participate in the system. Like, well, then nothing will actually ever change. You're just as bad as the people that perpetuate the system. That's the thing. That's why at least Marxists advocate for revolution. It's not that they're anti-democratic, or at least nominally a lot of them aren't. It's that they say we have to fundamentally change the system and that just voting on its own is not going to change that system. It mm. needs a ra radical shift of power, and that's why the dictatorship of the proletariat needs to happen. Right, is to enable that radical shift um, into something more egalitarian. Um, yeah, I. That's why I'm saying, like, I get it, but revolution implies a level of violence that I personally am not comfortable with. Right, like I make jokes about the guillotine, <laughs> but yeah. like that's not necessarily something that I'm comfortable with, and I acknowledge. Well, that. I feel like that like, gets very dangerously close to Thanos mm -hmm. was correct territory and like Yeah. It can be. It, it can like you Yeah, no, it can be. That's why that's why I think it's interesting. Like, I'm not gonna pretend that violent protests or violent revolution, whatever, isn't necessary sometimes. No, I think it absolutely has its uh, value. I'm just saying yeah. I personally know myself as not being able to perform that act, right? I, I'm not at a stage in my life where I feel comfortable saying I could commit violence against my fellow fellow human being, but I understand why someone would, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's what's kind of interesting is that philosophically, when you're saying like it can get into Thanos territory very fast, that's why a lot of Marxists also advocate that you need an ethics that accompanies it. It's not just revolution for the sake of revolution. You need an ethical standard that goes with it and for a lot of them, that ethical standard is the achievement of egalitarian societies like communism, right? Um, anyway, I don't know if that makes sense to you, <laughs> but yeah, or you're just... No. Mm? no, no, I follow you. And again, like, I'm not saying I'm not against the rebel, but it feels like these people are like that aren't voting because maybe I'm just disillusioned in my own way now, but it seems like these people yeah. are that aren't voting to cause a revolution never actually try to organize a revolution. It's true. Or at least if yeah. they do it, they do it in the most half-assed way. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Um, so it like, was... It's, um, it's, it just feels more and more like people are just giving excuses not to participate in the system so that they can do what they really want to do. Complain about the system. Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, there, it was... Um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Mark Fisher, who's a writer who passed away a few years ago. Um he had a really good point. It's like, oh, we're advocating for the revolution tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> like, it's always delayed. It's never quite there because you have to keep reading theory or whatever, right? And there is some value to that. But yeah, actual action, I think, is whether it's voting or revolution, do it. Do something. Um, other things that um, communists in Canada really helped to do was... Uh, actually mobilize uh, the unemployed in relief camps, especially during the Depression, right? Which a lot of people in that time um, took that as a moment to radicalize themselves, right? Much like you saw actually, by the way, in 2008 here in North America after the housing market crash, you could see actually a sharp spike in radical <laughs> uh, sentiments 
right, uh, mm -hmm. against the system, right? So the depression actually had a similar effect. Um, and, you know, many in Canada actually helped recruit volunteers to fight fascism in the Spanish Civil War, including one of the most famous communists in Canada, Norman Bethune, who was a doctor and a communist and who actually did a lot of work in the Spanish Civil War and is actually one of the only Canadians to be lauded as a national hero in China, right? Because he worked with the Chinese during their um, uh, revolution in the 1940s, right? So, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Again, say what you will about where where these countries went to, right? Um, but it is kind of interesting that it's not just like, oh, Canada, small little country, haha, no one cares. Like these people actually had an impact internationally. Oh, right? oh it, it, we, yeah. it's Canada and honestly, large parts of the world forgets its actual impact on things. Like we we forget sometimes we are a G eight country member of NATO, large presence on the political stage. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So yeah, though that's more of the positive stuff. Like I said, um, sorry, Fred Rose was elected. Um, in nineteen forty three. Not. Uh, I don't think Buck was ever elected. Um, but um, there a lot of most of in like electoral success, mostly communists. Uh, served in municipal councils or provincial grassroots movement comrades right like they and were you know less what? so on the federal level but yeah. also like most political scientists say now nowadays those grassroots smaller things actually have a lot more power to them yeah because there's a lot more the, there's exactly. a lot less red tape and a lot less like hand shaking that you have to do exactly Right. That's why I'm, I'm mentioning like these things that they did with other workers and immigrants and feminists and all of that is that in changing the fundamental roots of society is what's, you know, actually making and action and possible. Sense. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like I said before, the the Second World War would hinder a lot of people's faith in communism. Right. With like uh, the Nazi Soviet alliance, which was mostly strategic but did shake a lot of people's faith. Um, and also just later revelations by um, uh, by um, Khrushchev after Stalin's death of like what the Stalin regime actually was would shake people further, right, in their faith. And so by the 1960s and 70s, you know, communism in Canada was very much on the decline, right? Mm -hmm. And often the party would, adopt different names like the labor progressive party and anything to mostly... distance itself from the name communism yes exactly and by the way like i get it from a marketing perspective but also it's You're a bit a bunch of, a of fucking cowards yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you had an opportunity here to almost the revolution you are... can't live comrade if we're not fighting together that's the thing like i wonder is because even at the beginning, there was smearing of the Reds and lefties, right? Generally speaking. so And you still adopted the name, but you kept doing, as you were saying, like grassroots movements. And what's kind of interesting is that as the party changed its name and distanced itself from the actual, uh, from the name of communism, it also distanced itself from, um, from the actual grassroots things and achievements that the original party had achieved, right? And it mostly became just an electoral circle jerk, right? This The type that you see with like the NDP, for example, right? Nice. I don't see the NDP doing much in terms of grassroots, rights, for example, right? Um, so I don't know if you agree with me on that one, but I do find it interesting that you do see this kind of distancing from the people it, seem, it actually from your claims own roots. to represent right. yeah, exactly. from, your, from who you are you're basically yeah, trying to exactly. say that's not who you are it's like you're you can change your name but at least still do the work but no well, that's how these parties keep the diluting work. themselves and that's the problem with electoral politics for a lot of lefties is yeah. like it's not it's not about actually serving the people right um and so a lot when you ask a lot of marxists right if you want to take um, the theory of Mao, for example, right? 
um, which was the party line. In the little right. red book? Yeah, like, but yes, in this case, yeah, literally, which is the idea of like actually asking people directly what they want. Okay. Um, and they uh, they vote on it. So and then I they, feel like one hour warning. We need to okay. <laughs> we should probably get into the literature. Okay, fine. So for, for the basic rundown, Communism Canada grew for a while, but then due to things like the F, like what happened with World War II and our fighting against the USSR, the communists of Canada distanced themselves from the name of the society upon which they had staked their identity. Yeah. Yeah. And as we know, just like in the US, the, the Red Scare did take over Canada as well for a time. Mm-hmm. Now, surprising perhaps no one, a lot of the Marxist ideas would seep into a lot of uh, literary types and artistic types um, because, you know, a lot of them are idealists, right? And I count myself along these people like, oh, we can change the world through art and might as well do it in an egalitarian really? society. Really? You're an idealist? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I meant like I artistic about to say, people you're, in general. You're, our conversations, you're, pr- you're pretty nihilist in general. No, no, I meant like artistic people in general, like uh, tend to have these types of associations. Oh, yeah, oh 100% with... poetic, wishy washy bullshit. Yeah. By the way, I don't think that's true with one of the two authors that we're going to talk that we can talk about today. But uh, yeah, like I just want to mention one of them and we can talk more in depth about the other one because sure. I find her more interesting. Um, but yeah. Um, the first one that I want to mention is a guy called Joe Sylvester Wallace, who at the time in the 1920s and 30s was by far the most successful writer associated with the Communist Party of Canada. And he would remain a supporter and member of the party for his whole life and career. Um, today, he's not known at all, right? But at the time, he was by far the lefty who was the most published, translated, read, and acclaimed right both within communist circles in canada and outside right in the ussr in china and so on right um and just to give people an idea of the type of poetry that he wrote which i'm not a huge fan of to me it reads a lot like alexander mclaughlin right who we've talked about on the show (laughs) before Right. Very much owing to like British and American traditions um, of the 19th century. But hey, that's just me. But this is a poem that appeared in a journal called Worker, which was published in the 1920s and 30s and was by far the journal that published the most uh, lefty um, or generally left wing uh, poetry and literature at the time. But this one's called Awake, right? which is basically an appeal to workers to reclaim the heritage that was stolen to uh, by them uh, that was stolen from them by capitalism um and it goes something like this or at least this is part of it you hacked in halves a hemisphere to bring two alien oceans near and striding across a continent you made earth blossom wherever you went and plunged your hands in pockets of earth to toss its coins like a th- spendthrift forth and rising above the flight of birds you smoked the sky with your chosen words. Um, which I think is kind of, yeah, it's not my cup of tea, right? But I do like it for being an early representation of how uh, at least some people were aware of how capitalism is just destroying the earth, right? And <laughs> like literally bending the world to its will to make a profit, right? Um, but what happens, I think, in the process of this particular poem is that he tends to idealize the worker a lot, right? And like these very folkloric terms, right? Um, but yeah, I just want, I know you haven't read this one because I couldn't find a digital version of it, but um, I just wanted to read that as a good representation of what was popular and common among lefty literature at the time. Right? Um The other one I want to talk about, and we can maybe spend the rest of the podcast talking about her, is um, Dorothy Livesay. Have you ever heard of her? Because she's quite well known in Canlit circles. Drop it like it's hot. I'm sorry? Drop it like it's hot. (laughs) Um, So Livesay is, or was, I think she's dead now. I should have looked this up. Um, 
I'm going to look it up right now. Uh, is or was? Was. Uh, she died 27 years ago. Um, so she was a Canadian poet and very much one who was acclaimed in her time. Um, very much as a wide-spoken and outspoken champion of feminism, nationalism, elder rights, and socialism. And she was a member of the Communist Party of Canada for a bit um, in the 1920s and 30s. She would break with the party um, after World War II. Um, but she won two Governor General's Awards for her poetry. The first one in 1944 for a collection called Day and Night, which we'll talk about. And the second one in 1947, uh, which was called Poems for People. And she would go on to co-found the League of Canadian Poets, the Canadian branch of Amnesty International, and the Committee for an Independent Canada, right? As well as, as, well as poetry magazines like Contemporary Verse, um, which is pretty huge in um, the poetry scene. And, you know, again, just relating a bit of her personal life here outside of being obviously interested in human rights by helping found Amnesty International Canada, right? Mm -hmm. um, she would go on to teach English in Africa, where the plight that the children she saw suffered um, would you know, very much inspire her to write very outspoken and critical poems of the system that allowed this to happen. Um, but yeah, the Reading I had you right linked to in the notes is day from day and night. Feels all right. That's a real song too, right? You know that? Yeah, no, I, I'm aware. Except day and night, the lesser version by Laura T. Live say obviously, because the, the song is very much the superior version of day and night. <laughs> day and night. So for those who can't see me, I'm jamming out in my seat right now. Hell yeah. The 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 collection itself of Day and Night was published in 44, but the poem on its own of Day and Night, the titular poem, was published in 35 or written in 35. So very much in the time when Live Say was still a dedicated communist. Um and did you have a chance to read some of this, if not all of Day and Night? Yeah, it's a pretty short poem. Yeah. Which is exactly. how I like my poetry. There you go. Um, do you want to read parts of it or tell me like what you thought? Dawn, of some of it? red and angry, whistled loud and sends a geyser shaft of steam searching the air. Scream after scream announces that the churn of life must move. The giant arm come in. Men in a stream, a, a moving human belt. Move into sockets, everyone a bolt. The fun begins, a humming, whirring drum. Men do a dance in time to the machine. One step forward, two steps back. Shove the lever, push it back. While our no whirls around about, G own shuffles, bolts about. One step forward, hear it crack. Smashing rhythm, two steps back. Your heartbeat pounds against your throat. The roaring voices drown your shout. Across the way, a writhing whack sets you spinning, two steps back. One step forward, two steps back. So that was the opening of the poem, and it was it's kind of haunting, the mm -hmm. fact that they take, it's, again, it's the wild part of how she uses what is like a very fun thing of dance and music, huh. which is one of our, like, one of the oldest forms of self-expression, and then how capitalism and the machine production of it all has perverted it. Like, there's a, there's a, there's a horrible dance and rhythm to it yeah absolutely it reminds me of some of the other music that's come out around the same time like i owe my soul to the company store in one man it da -da -da -da. kind of reminds me as well or at least it is especially the way that you read it obviously you were making um a little bit of a joke with the way that you were uh, uh, reading it but it reminds me of like the way that you sometimes see on chain gangs or <laughs> Uh, workers' lines, right? That you'd sing a song in order to keep the rhythm or to pass mm -hmm. the time, right? Um, and again, to kind of bring back to this idea of perverting music, right? Rather than being a form of entertainment, 
Um, it's something to get you through the drudgery of the factory work. Oh, hundred right? percent. And like these are songs that people have been using for years to help with the work, and now we get this almost even like it's also it, the the perversion of it all continues with how it's described at the start, like water, the yeah. life giver of all things, that then again is forced to turn into this company, Absolutely. this company effect. We really like the opening line, right? Dawn, red and angry. Um, your your Red Dawn, the movie. But I don't know, like to me, this kind of rings as um her pointing to the fact that a lot of the radical ideas aren't done at the factory itself. They're done afterward in in cover of the night, right? Especially in the 30s when you know just before just after this poem was written you would have the padlock law that i talked about earlier so there is some crackdown that's happening so you'd have to use the cover of the night to talk about these things and so by the time dawn arrives i like that it's red and angry red of course symbol of like the radical left um or color of the radical left but also you know jeff very much demonstrates or is containing the anger of these workers who just spent the cover of the night talking about how shitty um, their conditions are, right? I don't know. Maybe that's me that's overreading this, but I feel like that's an interesting opening to this idea, mm-hmm. right? Especially some of the ones that we've talked about in this particular episode. Um, I want to read a little bit of the second part of the poem, if you're okay with that. Go ahead. I can uh... I can push through and, and I keep my capitalism strong. It's just a little bit, just to mm-hmm. uh, to hammer home a point that you made earlier. This is just the first few lines of the second part. Day and night are rising and falling. Day and night shift gears and slip rattling. Down the runway, shot into storerooms, where only arms and a notebook remember the record of evil, the sum of commitments. We move as though sleep's revolving memories, piling up hatred, stealing the remnants, doors forever folding before us. And where is the recompense? On what agenda will you set love down? Who knows of peace? And obviously, well, it's, it's very explicit here, right? Uh, she's, she's pointing to the factory as evil, right? Or the operation of the factory. But very much in a similar vein as the Sylvester poem that I read earlier, I like the idea day and night are rising and falling. They shift gears and slip rattling. In the sense of like, <laughs> the, in this case, nature itself is becoming integrated into the machine, right? You can never escape it. The rotations of night and day are part of the capitalism work world, right? <laughs> um, the nine to five is a capitalist myth, right? <laughs> right. right? Um, you could kind of almost see that permeate here. I don't know if you had anything to add in this case, but I... That's well, it of, also brings to what, mind the very horrifying question that has been discussed in other short stories yeah. what of what happens when the machine stops. There we go. Like, we've built our entire life. And I think that's part of the poem's point, is it's really trying to, like, a dance has to end at some point. A dance is finished. What do you do when the dance finishes? Or do you change So if you dances? look at the last section, if you look yeah. at section three, mm-hmm. the little dance section goes... Boss, I'm smothered in the darkness. Boss, I'm shriveled in the flames. Boss, I'm blacker than my brother. Blow your breath down here. Yeah. Shadrach, Mechak, and Abednego burn in the furnace, whirling slow. And then the actual, like, the wheel must limp till it hangs still and crumpled men pour down the hill, day and night, night and day, till life is turned the other way. The machine stops and we die. Or at least something dies. Maybe it's not us. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of left ambiguous. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah, that's kind of, I, I like that. I like that line so much. Uh, day and night, night and day till life is turned the other way. Right. Because it, she doesn't say that life is shunned or life is snuffed out. She's saying it's turned the other way. So it's going into a different direction is what I read there. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I recommend, by the way, that people read this entire collection. Again, it's on archive.org. It's, very it's great. Well done. 
Yeah, no, she's fantastic. Read no, Dorothy Lyons. Like I poked stuff. around a bit in some of her other works. So it was very good. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, she's awesome. So the last question I have for you before we finish, because I know you want to end this. Just I, like the machine. I think to come back to the uh, to Mark Fisher, who I brought up earlier, um, he has an interesting point in saying, you know, all of these ideas, right? If you're dedicated to moving past the system that we live in right? If that's your jam. Um, he contemplates the idea of whether or not you can actually still use the term communism effectively in the 21st century, right? Because of everything that's that has been put through, right? <laughs> of Cold War propaganda, Stalin, all of that, right? Um, and I don't know, like, I guess as a final question to you, whether that's something that you want or not, do you think that it's something that is achievable or do we think we have to just come up with a different name for something uh, for it and go in a different direction? Like, I don't know if that question is clear. So you think we need to, sorry, repeat? No, that's the, I think that's very much Mark Fisher's point is that it's kind of impossible to repeat what oh, happened okay. in the past. Right. Oh, okay. You're talking about. Oh, yeah. His. Yeah. No, we're not. It's the. There's too much that's happened for us to try and repeat. Yeah. Like we would need to come in with a new. We would need to rename communism to something new. You know, to to package and sell it better. Yeah. But that's that's the issue. <laughs> what What do you call it? And why not? Yeah, how do you sell? Thing? How do you sell communism? And how do you and make the it answer interesting? Is you don't. Checkmates, communist capitalism wins. That's it. America. That's all you needed. <laughs> America's like, red hot dong takes the day. Of a piping hot dose of American freedom, it's sent to you by a drone. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, I I agree with you. I think that the ideas behind it are interesting in that. You know, despite the failures of the past, many of the ideas associated with it are ones that you should, that can and should be striven for. Mm -hmm. The idea of equality among fellow men and women, of actually getting proper compensation and and justice, right? Ethical justice in this world, I think, is a strong component of it. I think that's something that should be striven for. Um, but I, I do agree that you can't. I think we're too far gone into the Cold War mentality to call it the same thing. It would never pass, I think, or I have a lot of mm -hmm. difficulty for it to pass mm -hmm. with contemporary audiences that have just been subsumed in Cold War ideology for good or ill for so long. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to call it something else. And I don't know if... I don't know if either you or I will live to see a different system, whether it's that or anything else. I don't know. But what I do think we can learn from like this particular time period when people were advocating for this type of ideology is mm -hmm. that they were willing to take a chance on a different future. Mm -hmm. And I find that admirable. And I think we'll do the same. Do you? I think we'll take a chance in the future. We'll we'll be forced to, like we'll reach a point where there is no other option but to take chance. But that option is now. I feel it's never been now though. It's always that's the that's the course of humanity. Our option has always been now, but we never take now. We take later, but we will take that chance eventually. We've done it before, yeah. and we'll do it again. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I I don't know. Do you think we'll live to see it? Uh, who us specifically or society specifically. in general? No, yeah, you and I. Okay. Yeah, probably. Okay. I, you genuinely think that the world's about to end, okay? You believe in the doomsday clock. I, I'm hopeful enough that I would want to see it happen, and I, I advocate that we should strive for it. But I am, I, I, I'll put it this way: I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but I hope it does. I think it will. I think we don't give ourselves enough credit sometimes. Okay. Oh. I mean, we could bet on it, but it's not going to matter much in the end. So, Because <laughs> cash is going to be meaningless in this future hellscape. Yeah, invest in gold! <laughs> you mean water? 
Yeah, sure. Them too, I guess. <laughs> Liquid gold. All right. So for those of you who weren't interested in us ranting and raving about capitalism and how it sucks for the last two episodes, good news. We're not going to do it on the next episode. We're going to oh, talk about something it. else. We can if you want. I'm sure there's going to be a way that we can rant to get it uh, against <laughs> it. That's fine. I don't mind. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Thanks for sticking around for this first yeah. episode of the year, this rambling episode, but I think a still interesting one. Um, Much appreciate to see to have people come back to us time after time, genuinely. Yeah, and actually increase in our listenership. So that's awesome. Um, next episode, something else. I think I have uh, I have an episode planned on Japanese Canadians. That's kind of cool. Um, and yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, next if you want to support the show, you just Patreon. You, everyone has a Patreon page now. You you know what to do. You know, send us an email, send us a message on Facebook, do all that good stuff. So write a review. You know, it's it's 2024. Everyone listens to podcasts. Everyone knows what to do. Do the yeah, stuff. Yeah, you know what to do. We're in the space. We're on the Googles, the clouds. Just Google you know the stuff. stuff. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. And Mac, it's always a pleasure. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.